like to welcome our students to this discussion. I'm here talking to Dr. Spencer Lucas from the New Mexico Museum of Natural History, and we're going to discuss the epoch during which uh, the Megalodon existed, and Spencer is also going to tell us a little bit about what was happening in New Mexico. We weren't a seacoast at that time, but we are interested in learning a little bit about what was happening here in New Mexico. Well, the Megalodon lived during the Miocene. That whole epic runs from about, what, 25 to maybe four or five million years ago. Its fossils, at least the North American one, are found in the southeastern United States. They're found in the Carolinas or in Florida, because at the time, sea level was higher. So a lot of those areas were under under seawater. But as Mary just said, New Mexico was a long way from the sea during the Miocene. In fact, I would say New Mexico was probably about as far from the sea in the Miocene as it is today. But we do have a lot of fossils. There was a lot happening in New Mexico on land. So let me just talk about what was going on in New Mexico then in the Miocene. When dinosaurs went extinct at about 65 million years ago, much of Western United States was very close to or at sea level. And that was true of New Mexico. But beginning in the Eocene, say about 45 or 50 million years ago, we start to see the building up of the altitudes. And by Miocene time, things were well above sea level. In general, I don't think the mountains in northern New Mexico were as high in the Miocene as they are now. Things have continued to uplift, but there were mountains. And so the uplift of the mountains was an important thing that happened. The other thing that was happening, though, was the Rio Grande River system was just beginning. And this was occurring because the Rio Grande Rift, which is a huge fracture that runs the length of the state, essentially, was beginning to open up. In that rift, there were rivers flowing there were lakes, there were even dune fields. And it's in that rift, the sediments that were deposited in the rift, that we get New Mexico's most extensive Miocene fossil record. It's a record of everything from fossil lizards and turtles, all the way up to fossil elephants or proboscideans, camels, horses, all these kinds of animals that were living in the state during the Miocene. So you could say you're seeing freshwater rivers and lakes forming in the rift, and the sediments that are deposited by those rivers and lakes were burying the bones the teeth of these extinct mammals, these extinct reptiles, and that's where we get this extensive fossil record. Now, the other thing, though, that was happening was uh, east of the mountain chain, and you can think of the current Sangre de Cristo mountain front, there were rivers flowing eastward from those mountains towards Texas. And those rivers produced a pile of sediment that are, it's a very famous bunch of rocks called the Ogallala Formation or the Ogallala Group. The reason they're so famous is the Ogallala in the subsurface is an extremely important aquifer. And anybody who lives out on the high plains of eastern New Mexico and into West Texas knows about the Ogallala Aquifer. So these river systems were flowing from the central mountain chain of New Mexico towards Texas. They left gravels and other sediments in New Mexico. And finally, when they got to Texas, there were rivers flowing there and there were lakes that formed. And one of the things that happens is all the other mammals, the similar mammals who are living in, particularly in West Texas, many of them get fossilized. So we have some of the same animals we find in the rift, we find in Texas, the interesting thing about the Oglala in New Mexico is the only f- Miocene fossil we've ever found, or anybody ever found, I should say, is a big jaw of a mastodon that was found near Clovis. But most of the Ogallala sediments in New Mexico are very coarse grained. They're gravels capped with caliche, and they're, they're not the kind of rocks that would easily preserve fossils. Uh, when we're talking about the extinction of the megalodon, the information that we have that we're sharing is that about 2 million years ago is when uh, megalodon became extinct. The other information we have is because of the climate change is one of the reasons why we had the extinction. Uh, The thinking is it may have gone extinct because of the onset of a a tremendous ice ages, which really in in some respects began then. Uh, Another theory that uh, is part of this exhibit, it talks a little bit about when uh, South America and North America came together. North and South America were separate until about 3 million years ago when Panamanian Isthmus was connected. That, that had a big effect and that may have had an effect on Megalodon because closing off the uh, ocean flow, Pacific to Atlantic by closing Panama 
had a big effect on ocean circulation in the Atlantic basin. And it also probably had a big effect on temperature. And it was may well have been a factor. It's thought to be a factor in the ice ages that occurred then. Oh. So it could be that the closing of the Panamanian Isthmus had a negative effect on water temperature in or a cooling of water temperature occurred in the Atlantic Basin, and that could have affected the megalodon. One right. thing I did want to talk talk to you about is the museum. I mean, right now we're open, but we're only open part-time at limited capacity. Any new discoveries? We just described a complete shark, a Paleozoic shark that was found in the Manzano Mountains. And, and the media was picked up as, it was called the Godzilla shark. <laughs> so, if you, so if you Google Godzilla shark, you'll see the stories, the media coverage of this new kind of shark. So that fossil is not on display yet. We're hoping to put it out this summer. Who discovered it? It's a kind of funny story. I ran a scientific meeting at the museum in 2013, and we took the scientist on a field trip to the Manzano Mountain. And one of the scientists at the meeting, who was a, a graduate student at the time, he found it. Now, you know, it's funny when he found it, of course, we had a lot of scientists there and we, we knew it was there was bone. We can only see part of the fossil. And there was this big hunk of what looked like bone sticking out. So we actually thought it was an amphibian bone. But later, when we went back and really started to dig it up, then we realized that what we had was a skeleton of, of a pretty big shark about for that time period, a shark that was about seven feet long, which is small compared to Megalodon. But if you go back 300 million, that's a big shark. When you're preparing the fossils, how long does it take? I know you have to stabilize these things. It's a whole process. Well, yeah, if it's a lot of fossil, like the shark was almost the whole animal, that took about six years. So it's a long and, and very careful process. It's a funny thing that this shark we described, this Godzilla shark, mm -hmm. all the cartilage was preserved. That's the rare thing. Yeah, most sharks... You know, the, the trouble with the fossil record of sharks is, is that their skeletons are all cartilage, right. except for their teeth. And so typically, yeah, most everything we know about sharks comes from their teeth. But this Godzilla shark, we found the fossil cartilage was preserved. So the whole animal was there, which was really wow. amazing. Yeah, yeah, very unusual and a really unique opportunity to see what the whole shark skeleton looked like. Hopefully, like I said, this summer we'll have it out on display. We sure appreciate you talking to us giving us a little bit more information about New Mexico during the time that the Megalodon lived. Uh, we will go up to the uh, Museum of Natural History in uh, Albuquerque. We're lucky to have it and yeah. lucky to have you. Thank you for that. Pleasure talking to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.